All right, Steve, I'm guessing that, as with me, uh, a lot of people are sort of curious about spread betting, but haven't really taken a plunge. Can you sort of explain your thinking behind some of the markets? You've mentioned the SPs, and, you know, just give us a rough guide of distances, SPs, anything else you bet on. All right. I think when, when you come back to this, because I mentioned before, I wasn't that great a better at, at ordinary betting, but I did know a bit about horse racing. So start with something you know. Start with a sport you know. That, that's the first thing. So you, you have got some background in it and what you want to do. The ones I've chosen are very simple ones in one respect, that what you do, for example, for the SP betting, you have to say what the total SPs for a meeting are. So these are bets added to get these bets. These bets are added together. Okay, so if you have a six to one winner in the first race, four to one winner in the second race, etc., add them all together, you get an answer. That's a really good thing to be betted on um, because where you've added all these things together, you reduce the, the variation. So, for example, you might be wrong on the first race, you predicted it to be four to one, it's actually eight to one, but then the next race where you predicted it five to one, an even money an even money favourite goes off. So at the end of the day, you come together, it's easier to do. Spread betting on a single event is harder because you've got a much wider range of results to, be, to come from. You've got you're much more at the risk of things going strangely wrong. One race, it could be run by a short head, it could be won by 30 lengths. By the way, you are limited in national hunt racing, certainly. 30 lengths is a maximum. You, you, so one firm, SpreadX, does a bet where you can bet up to 99 lengths if you think you've got a big enough, you've got a horse that's going to win by a lot. So find something you know about to start with and have a look at the quotes and try and see just yourself. Do it, does that seem sensible to you? Does that seem a, a reasonable thing? And if it's not seeming reasonable, OK, let's look at it. You can go into the more refined bits. And yes, you can build up databases. You can do all sorts of things. But often, just, but sometimes just looking at it, just going through it yourself, what's likely to win the race. A good, um, another one that they do, which is quite a nice one, is on how many favourites are going to win in a given day on a given meeting, which you can do as a spread bet. That's quite an interesting one because you can look through the list of favourites quite easily and go, well, that what you know, what's likely to be favourite, which is another, you know, you don't you have to check that. Is this a good favourite? Is it a bad favourite? What are the firms going to think? And you can put together quite sensible thoughts about that. Okay, so you've uh, other things you bet on cricket and football. Yeah, um, football. I can do that one for you. I do long-term spread bets, which are on how many points a team is going to get through the season. And I'll probably do um, sort of a couple in each of the English divisions, and it runs all season. There's a certain amount of um, thing, uh, thoughts in the betting field that long-term bets aren't a great plan because you're tying your money up, which you are. You know, you're putting your money in. I've done two. I did two this year. One which was selling Sheffield United points. Sorry, Sheffield Wednesday points. And the other one was buying Luton points, both of which are doing quite nicely. Thank you. But you can bet a bit more on those because I'm betting £50 a point. That's my, my size bet on those. But you can bet more on those because basically there's going to be less variation at the, the end of the season. They're not going to be hugely different from what the spread better say, unless the team has a real disaster or goes absolutely brilliantly. For example, when Leicester won, you'd have made a fortune, uh, you know, betting on doing a spread bet on that. So I think they were forecast about 40 on points, 45 points for the season. And obviously they won it. And you'd have made a huge amount. So what would you what would you base your football bets on what i do with football bets that one is a bit of a mathematical model now some of my stuff is mathematically modeled in the sense that you can take a database and compress it down into effectively some laws so you can look at it and that's what i do that's what i do for the football and i try and find where the spread betting firms have got it wrong or where they've put where they've gotten on and that can happen because again as i said before about the markets 
if people people like to buy football spread bets because quite often they support the team so you know i've got a friend who bought villa points this this season at 39 and a half he's doing very nicely you know he's doing really well on that bet it's probably i think it's about 18 or 19 points ahead at the moment so that's 18 or 19 times back his stake he's going to get get i mean he can trade out now if he likes which is another thing you can do but um no that is so my one is on is on on model but just do what oops, there we are just do what you feel works are you um for what of a better word, a bit of an anorak. Do you collect data and make yes. a lot of spreadsheets? And, and is that an important tool on top of pro yes. form? Uh, I mean, yes. If you're going to do it seriously, you need the data because you you can't. Uh, and also, it's a question of accessing it. It, it, it. Pro form and all the other databases are really good, but it takes a long time. For example, to go through and look at all the winning distances at Leicester for the last five years on it. Whereas if you've got those, if you've got that accessible in on a computer, in another form, in a spreadsheet or whatever, if you've got that accessible and you've done all the working out, it just brings it up for you. So it's, it's a way of accessing the data. But now, now, if you're looking back at uh, past results at a meeting, is, is there any sort of logic to, to how important they are? I mean, if you've got the the results for the last 20 years of the Holden Gold Cup, for example, would that actually have any bearing on this year? Mm, right. Individual races, other than certain things like the Grand National, aren't a lot of help um, because things can change. They can, and you, you have to spend time trying to track them down as to what course they were run on sometimes never mind worrying what distance they were run at what the going what you know was the going what it was i wouldn't worry about an individual race though this we're just coming up to cheltenham most of the firms are doing bets on winning distances at cheltenham winning sps at cheltenham etc so you, you know yes you can look at do specialist things like that but looking back over one meeting um I particularly laugh at the little tables you get in the, the racing post and things telling me that, that seven-year-olds have got a huge chance of winning because they've won eight out of the last 10 races at a particular course over a particular distance, whatever. You know, it, it's sometimes those statistics aren't worth what they're... They well, there's, people that, there's people that would disagree with you on that, Steve. Very clever I'm people. Sure that, I'm, sure that, I'm sure they do. And if they could make money out of them, happy days. But a lot of the time, it, it, it's a field space. It, it's convenient. Yeah, it's all about opinion. So the um, you've already explained how your day pans out. I mean, you know, a, a lot the spread betting is hard enough for anybody to work out what might win. Now, you've already covered it a bit without having to predict how far they're going to win and what price they're going to win at. I don't have to know what's going to win. I don't is have that, to know. Is that what makes it easier for you? Yeah. I don't care what's going to win. One of the great delights is going to a race meeting with my friends. So I, I, I like going racing um, when, when we can, obviously. Um, and you're going with your friends. And um, I am frantically cheering on the third horse because I've done second to third distances and I really would like him to catch up, please. Or my favourite, which I have, my favourite one, is when you're cheering home a 66 to one outsider, which is coming up because you've bought SPs. And this is absolutely wonderful because you can be open and older in this thing and everyone's looking at you and going, why has he backed that? Why the hell has he backed that horse? And I haven't backed it particularly. I just want any long prize horse will do me. You know, this, this one's there. Let, let's cheer him on. Right, if you go in the second and third distances, now tell me a bit about that. How on earth do you come up with an accurate figure on those? Okay. Uh, second to third distances, it, most people shy away from it. And I try and explain to my friends, I'm doing second to third distances, and they look at you as if you've just, you've, you've gone completely mad. It isn't. Races, quite a lot of races, if you look at them, just, just watching races, Quite a lot of races, you get races where two horses will go off at the start, toward, get, get into the finishing straight, two horses will go off, the rest of them, they sort of decide really that they're not going to catch these first two and they steady up behind. So you, you, you have a tendency of getting wide gaps sometimes. Conversely, you can get races where you get a blanket, where you get three or four horses coming over the last together, you get blanket, you get blanket finishes. The key point is, 
there's quite a widespread of things that can happen with certain with certain preferred distances. That is also, whilst it's a bit of a threat in that you can get it badly wrong, you can also get it very, very right. Um, and it's a good source of get, getting an income because it's something you can bet on that's got a nice, a nice variation to it. If you get on the right side of it. Just to put it in perspective, um, on my sell bets, so I have when I'm doing my selling bets, so I'm selling SP, selling winning distances, selling second thirds, I have to be right 60% of the time. If I'm right 60% of the time, I will make money. That's all I got to do. I got to be right 60% of the time. Not 100%, 60%. Okay, so, so yeah, carry on, sorry. No, no, it, and, and so you've got, but that is quite hard. I'm sorry, uh, you know, it, if you look at professional spread bettors uh, or professional gamblers in America, they reckon if you can get 60% of your bets correct, you're backing the winner on, backing the winner there, you're doing well. Okay, now, so you've you've been doing it for years. You've got your your pro form. You've got your spreadsheets. You've got all your data. You very intelligent sort of fellow. You've worked it all out. Now, do you still get emotionally involved? Is this something where you're going to still sit in front of the telly screaming one home, or are you a Barney Curley that doesn't even really need to watch it? Um, I don't cheer horses home on the television because um, I, I'm not there. Uh, one of the funniest sights at Cheltenham I've ever seen was in the offices before racing started of a guy screaming a horse home on a virtual race course. Uh, at 20, yeah, he was 21, but he was shouting it home. No, I don't cheer him on at home. I will cheer them on the race course quite happily, um, but not at home. But yes, I do get involved sometimes. Generally, it's frustration when you think you've got it right and then one falls at the last or something goes wrong, um, you can really get it wrong. Um, there are some spectacular, one of my ones which do go wrong is for example, with low sun. I have a particular hatred of low sun because all of a sudden they take half the fences out of a race. That has a big effect on winning distances and even and on SPs because different horses, you know, you, you've got more chance of an outsider winning if you haven't got so many fences. So, yeah, a lot of frustration more than uh, cheering wildly home. OK, so the, the, if you've, so you've got all your facts and your figures, you've got all your bets, but in the scenario where you would never allow to watch it, would you still do it to make money? Uh, you know, if you couldn't watch it, would that take away the appeal? I could do it with, I could do it because it, it would be virtue, I, but it would be a bit disappointing because I like to see what's going on. I'm interested in racing. I've followed racing since I was a kid um, from being taken to the point to point when you were about eight. Um, and yes, we managed to bet when we were about eight and 10, we could go up to the bookmakers at a point to point, don't tell the gambling commission. Um, <laughs> and you started off then and that's what you did. Yeah, the views of the interviewee are not necessarily that of the publisher, I'll point out there. Absolutely. 